Hello everyone, I'm Chris, and this is a full recap of the original X-Men timeline released from 2000 to 2017. If you end up enjoying this video and want to see more from us, then make sure to click that subscribe button and click the bell to know anytime we upload a new video. Before superhero movies really took over the box office, the first film under the Marvel umbrella to break into the top 10 highest grossing films of the year was 2000's X-Men, spawning the beginning of a somewhat inconsistent but overall very successful franchise which lasted over two whole decades. Although, unlike the MCU, the studio behind the X-Men films, 20th Century Fox, didn't originally have a plan in place to build a long-standing interconnected universe, as seen by the many notable continuity errors sprinkled throughout the franchise's 13 films, which makes piecing things together in a timeline format difficult. But still we've decided to do exactly that. Although for today's timeline breakdown, we'll only be running through the events as they took place through the perspective of the franchise's main character, the Wolverine. So the only films that'll be included in this original X-Men timeline are X-Men, X2, X-Men The Last Stand, X-Men Origins Wolverine, X-Men First Class, The Wolverine, X-Men Days of Future Past, and Logan. Leaving out all three Deadpool films, which really appear to be in their own separate universe even after the events of Deadpool and Wolverine in our opinion, as well as X-Men Apocalypse, X-Men Dark Phoenix, and The New Mutants. If you'd like for us to run down this alternate X-Men timeline in the future though, make sure to let us know in the comments below. To begin, we have to head all the way back to 1845 and to Northwest Territories Canada where we meet a couple young boys named James Howlett and Victor Creed while at Jimmy's home, where the two are soon startled, along with Jimmy's father John, by some banging and shouting at the door from Victor's drunken father, Thomas Logan, calling for Jimmy's mother, Elizabeth. So John and Victor head downstairs, followed by a sudden gunshot that prompts Jimmy to run down as well, where he finds that Thomas has killed his father. This traumatic event subsequently triggers a mutation for the boy. His bone claws begin to sprout from his fists, before Jimmy, unable to control his anger, then rushes at and kills his father's murderer. Although, as he dies, Thomas reveals that he is his real father, not John. As it turns out, Jimmy was born out of an affair between Elizabeth and Victor's father. Jimmy's mother is horrified by her son's mutation, questioning what he even is, which prompts him to flee into the woods, followed by Victor, who we later learn is also a mutant, and who proclaims that, as brothers, they must stick together and protect one another seeing as they have no one else left who will accept them for who they are. As the two grow older, James, now going by Logan after his biological father, and Victor decide to put their abilities and overwhelming rage to good use, fighting for the US in multiple notable wars, such as the American Civil War and World War I, during each of which one of them takes a fatal shot, but their regenerative healing factors allow them to survive as well as basically not age over the course of their lives. Jumping ahead about 30 years now, into the home of a young mutant boy with telepathic abilities named Charles Xavier in Westchester, New York, as it's strangely intruded by a woman who appears to be his mother, but he knows it's not actually her, as he claims she's never stepped foot in their kitchen, and notices she's dressed exactly as she was in an old photograph on the wall. So they're forced to reveal their true self, and she turns out to also be a mutant named Raven Darkholm, with the ability to shapeshift into any living being. To her surprise, Charles is actually happy with this revelation, delighted to know he's not the only one in the world, and so he offers to let her stay at his place for as long as she wants, so she'll never have to steal again. In that same year, we're also introduced to a young Jewish boy named Eric Lenscher, as he's forcibly separated from his parents by Nazi soldiers within the Auschwitz concentration camp, a stressful and traumatizing scenario that causes his mutation to manifest as Eric, whilst being pulled away by multiple guards, suddenly begins bending open the metal gate separating him and his family, until the guard manages to knock him out. Shortly thereafter, Eric is taken to meet Nazi collaborator Dr. Klaus Schmidt, who taken notice of Eric's powerful display with the gate and so attempts to have him replicate it on a smaller scale by moving a coin. But Eric struggles to do so, prompting Schmidt to have Eric's mother brought into his office as well, and threatening to kill her if he fails to move the coin by the count of three. Still though, Eric's unable to do it, and so Schmidt shoots and kills his mother, which as he had expected, unlocks Eric's true power and enables him to wreak havoc on every metallic object nearby. Back to Logan and Victor though, who are now actively battling in World War II and are seen participating in the D-Day invasion, during which Victor begins to become noticeably more uncontrolled and violent, much to Logan's concern. 
At some point in the following year, the two brothers actually end up separated for a while, after Logan transfers from the European front to the Pacific front, where he's unfortunately soon captured by Japanese forces and sent to a POW camp near Nagasaki, in which he's held within a chained up well all the way until the Nagasaki bombing of August 9th, 1945 ahead of which he sees a young officer of the Imperial Japanese Army named Ichiro Yoshida helping evacuate the city, including the prisoners held within it, but for the soldier rushes to the well to help get Logan out as well, but he refuses and instead just advises Yoshida to leave. It appears it may be too late for him though, as the bomb is suddenly dropped, leaving him frozen in a state of shock until Logan rushes over to grab and bring him down into the well that they're unable to cover before the explosion reaches them. So Logan just covers Yoshida with the well's lid and takes the entirety of the impact onto himself, which Yoshida then watches his body heal from immediately after. Let's now jump ahead about 17 years so we can meet back up with a now adult Eric Lenscher who since being freed from the concentration camp following the conclusion of World War II, has been spending his days searching for the man who'd killed his mother. And now in 1962, he's finally discovered Schmidt's current whereabouts. So he makes the trip and finds him on his boat, strangely not appearing any older than he did almost 20 years ago, which we learn is attributed to his mutation as he's also a mutant with the ability to absorb energy. In addition, Schmidt's now surrounded himself with a trio of other mutants, which includes Riptide, who has the ability to create and manipulate powerful winds, a teleporter named Azazel, and a telepath named Emma Frost, who's also capable of transforming her skin into an impenetrable diamond, and who unleashes a telepathic attack against Eric, before sending him flying overboard into the ocean. So Eric then unleashes an attack onto them using the ship's anchor, forcing the group to flee via submarine, which Eric tries mightily to slow down, but it appears he may drown instead. That is until someone else suddenly dives into the water and helps bring him back to the surface, revealed to be an adult Charles Xavier, now a professor with a PhD in genetics, who's been on his own search for Schmidt, revealed to actually be named Sebastian Shaw after he and his mutant followers, also known as the Hellfire Club, were brought to his attention by CIA agent Maura McTaggart, herself having tracked down Charles after witnessing the Hellfire Club's powers up close while spying in on a private meeting between Shaw and US Army Colonel Hendry. Along with McTaggart and Charles in their search is a now adult Raven and another CIA agent who's been a believer in mutants for quite some time. And so, after being introduced to Charles and Raven and learning of their abilities, he agreed to let them operate in his facility off-site. There, we're also introduced to one of the CIA's most talented young researchers, Hank McCoy who it turns out is a mutant as well with superhuman strength, paired with some animalistic physical traits that he prefers to keep hidden. Although his abnormal appearance does draw the interest of Raven, with the two forming a bond over their common struggle that Hank believes he may be able to fix by creating a serum using a sample of Raven's blood. Also at the facility, Charles is presented with a radar installation that Hank had turned into a transmitter designed to amplify brainwaves and which Hank calls Cerebro that they believe could enhance his telepathic abilities and allow them to find other mutants. So Charles connects to the device and begins a search for others like them, before then heading off with Eric to recruit them onto their team. And although some decline their offer, such as Logan, they do successfully recruit Angel Salvador, who has the ability to grow wings and fly, as well as spit acidic projectiles, Armando Munoz, aka Darwin, who's able to adapt to any environment he's in, Alex Summers, aka Havoc, capable of generating powerful plasma blasts, and Sean Cassidy, aka Banshee, who can unleash sonic waves with his voice. Once having transported the new group to the facility, Charles, Eric, and Mora next head off to Russia, where Shaw's believed to be meeting with a Russian general. But once there, they come to find only Emma Frost has made the trip, so they're forced to settle for her, with Charles and Eric using their combined powers to restrain her and learn of exactly what Shaw's planning discovering that he's looking to start a nuclear war between the US and the Russians to rid of all the world's humans, leaving only mutants to thrive. Meanwhile, back at the team's facility, we learn why Shaw hadn't arrived in Russia, as he, Azazel, and Riptide suddenly attack and kill every agent in sight as they make their way towards the young mutants, who Shaw hopes to recruit for his cause, and he actually succeeds in recruiting Angel as well as Darwin or so it appears, as Darwin was actually just causing a distraction to allow Havoc a clean shot at Shaw. But unfortunately, Shaw easily absorbs Alex's blast and uses its energy to kill Darwin as he exits. Charles, upon his and Eric's return, following Shaw's attack, considers sending the team back home so no one else gets hurt. 
but they choose to stay, wanting to avenge Darwin. And so Charles transfers the team to his mansion and puts each of them, as well as Eric, through training to help them control and accept their powers to ensure they're fully prepared for their next battle, which is set to take place in Cuba, as Shaw has managed to coerce the Russian general from earlier into ordering for missiles to be placed there. The night prior to their mission, Hank reveals to Raven that he's finally completed his serum, but she's begun to have second thoughts, primarily as a result of Eric repeatedly urging her to accept her true self, which Hank doesn't believe is really what's best for her, since their appearances will likely never be deemed as beautiful by society, but his words just upset her and so she storms off, leaving Hank to take the serum alone, which appears to actually work, although only for a brief moment as it then quickly begins amplifying his mutation and instead turns him into a blue-skinned beast. Raven, meanwhile, heads over to Eric's room to try and seduce him, but she only succeeds upon reverting to her natural blue form, after which the two share a kiss. Once in Cuba the following day, the team successfully manages to thwart Shaw's initial attempt at starting World War III by taking out the Russian ships that he and the Hellfire Club had overtaken, forcing him to instead turn to his backup plan which sees him powering himself up with a nuclear generator to be the bomb itself, while Riptide, Azazel, and Angel battle the heroes. But eventually, Eric manages to take out Riptide, Banshee and Havoc knock down Angel, and Raven and Beast take out Azazel, as Eric makes his way towards Shaw, who Charles has found himself unable to telepathically locate or overtake thanks to Shaw's helmet constructed by Russian scientists. Shaw willingly makes his presence known to Eric though, still believing he can convince him to fight by his side. But although Eric does acknowledge the role Shaw played in transforming him into the weapon he is today, he still seeks vengeance for what he did to his mother. So using exposed metal wiring, he's able to remove Shaw's helmet so that Charles can freeze him, before putting the helmet on himself so that Charles can't stop him from slowly driving the same coin Shaw had tried to force him to move all those years ago straight through his skull and killing him. The Americans and Russians, meanwhile, have become aware of the mutant threats nearby, and so decide to both unleash their missiles onto them. But they're caught in midair by Eric, who then, despite Charles begging him not to, slowly turns the missiles back on the humans, forcing Charles to tackle him to the ground, although he's quickly punched off before Eric resumes his attack. So Mora then attempts to stop him by opening fire at him, but he manages to easily deflect each bullet, although inadvertently, he ends up sending one straight into Charles' spine which finally gets him to stop his attack as he rushes over to remove it. All of this friction between them, Eric warns, is exactly what the humans want, and he urges Charles that they must stand together. But Charles refuses to help him start a war, so Eric presents the others with an opportunity to join his brotherhood of mutants. And while Beast, Havoc, and Banshee choose to remain by Charles' side, Azazel, Riptide, Angel, and Raven decide to join and exit with Eric. Jumping ahead now to about four weeks later, as it's now revealed that a now wheelchair-ridden Charles, along with Hank, has transformed his home into a school for young mutants, hoping to give them a place where they can be accepted for who they are. While we see Eric has continued recruiting others for his cause, such as an imprisoned Emma Frost, and has now begun going by Magneto. During Magneto's search for other mutants to join his brotherhood, he discovers that the United States President John F. Kennedy is also a mutant. Although he's not the only one aware of this fact, as he soon also learns that there are plans to have Kennedy assassinated. So Eric travels to Dallas in hopes of preventing his death. But although he manages to momentarily curve the bullet using his abilities, he's soon intercepted by authorities, allowing the assassin to kill the president. In addition, Eric's attempt to save JFK's life is unfortunately perceived as him attempting to kill the president himself. And so, in a secret trial, Eric's found guilty of first-degree murder and conspiracy to assassinate the president. And for his crimes, he's imprisoned within a cell 100 floors beneath the Pentagon, built during World War II when there was a shortage of steel, so the foundation is pure concrete and sand. Charles, meanwhile, although not quite as bad, has been suffering a great deal himself, as during the Vietnam War, just one semester after opening his school for gifted youngsters, many of his older students and teachers get drafted eventually forcing the school to shut down for the time being. And that, coupled with the loss of his legs Raven and Eric, the latter of whom he now considers a monster, causes Charles to completely break down. Hank, heartbroken seeing the professor like this, attempts to help him by designing a serum to treat his spine, derived from the same formula that helps him control his own mutation. But while Hank only takes enough to keep himself balanced, Charles takes far too much, unable to bear the pain in voices any longer, causing his powers to fade. 
Also during the Vietnam War, we learn that since the incident in Cuba around 10 years ago, mutants have become of particular interest to one Bolivar Trask, the world's leading weapons designer and founder of Trask Industries. Unbeknownst to the public, Trask had begun capturing and experimenting on mutants, using their gifts to fuel his own research as he seeks to create technologically advanced robots called Sentinels with the sole purpose of wiping out all mutant kind. But when Trask presents the Sentinel program to US leaders in hopes of gaining their funding and support, he swiftly shut down as they don't believe mutants are a threat worth worrying about. Still, Trask looks to continue his research without their help, sending his personal assistant and bodyguard Major William Stryker to an American airbase in Saigon, Vietnam to retrieve several mutant soldiers, including Havoc and three mutants not yet introduced, Mortimer Toynbee, aka Toad, Eric Gitter, aka Inc, and Daniels. But just before Stryker arrives, Mystique manages to infiltrate the base disguised as a colonel, seeking to free the mutants forced to take part in this war and carry out Magneto's plans of recruiting them to the Brotherhood of Mutants. She soon discovers Trask Industries plans for them though, just before Stryker arrives who she promptly attacks as well as his goons, allowing the mutants to escape via airplane, while she decides to stay behind in hopes of learning more about Trask's experimentation on her kind. So she next travels to the Trask Industries building and disguised as Trask himself easily sneaks her way up to his office, in which she finds mutant autopsy reports, revealing that Trask had experimented on and killed Azazel, Angel Salvador, Emma Frost, and Banshee. Frightened and distraught from this discovery, Mystique prepares to bring an end to this once and for all and to kill Trask, which would be her first murder. And after infiltrating the Paris Peace Accords, during which Trask had planned to once again present his Sentinel program, Mystique quickly takes out each person in the room, including Stryker, before grabbing hold of the latter's gun and firing at Trask, killing him. Unfortunately, she's then immediately tased and apprehended by Stryker, who continues on with Trask's research in his honor by experimenting on and torturing Mystique now with the backing of world leaders who've been left frightened by mutants following her attack until Mystique eventually manages to escape. There's more attached to Stryker's interest with mutants than just his connection to Trask though, as it turns out his son Jason is also a mutant, who Stryker had originally sent to Xavier's school for gifted youngsters in hopes that he could cure him. But Charles refused, claiming that a mutation is not a disease, and so he was sent back home. Jason though, resented and blamed his parents for his condition leading him to begin projecting visions and scenarios into their brains that eventually led his mother to take her own life, in turn prompting Stryker to cryogenically freeze and imprison his son. In addition to Stryker's work on the Sentinel program and his own son, he also begins putting together a Black Ops team of mutants called Team X, which soon gains its final two members, Logan and Victor. Not much is known of what the two have been up to since World War II, outside of Logan getting a gig as a bodyguard and sleeping with his boss's daughter. But the two eventually end up battling alongside one another once again during the Vietnam War. Although soon, Victor's violent tendencies become even more prevalent when he attacks, captures, and attempts to rape a young Vietnamese village woman, forcing his platoon to interfere, which prompts Victor to unleash an attack against them, as well as kill a senior officer. Logan, although uneased by Victor's actions, still decides to defend and stand alongside his brother, resulting in them both being sentenced to death. But the two's healing factors make it impossible for the firing squad to carry out their sentences, so they're instead locked up in a cell, later to be met and recruited by Stryker in exchange for freeing them from their imprisonment. We then move ahead to the team's mission in Lagos, Nigeria, where they've been sent to retrieve a mysterious meteorite from a diamond trafficking operation. And there, we're introduced to each of Team X's members, including Fred Dukes, Chris Bradley, David Nord aka Agent Zero, John Rath, and Wade Wilson, a skilled assassin who, like Logan and Victor, possesses a regenerative healing factor. Using their combined skills, the team breaks their way into the compound and takes down its security en route to confronting its leader, from whom Stryker collects the meteorite and learns of the remote village where they'd found it, to which they travel next and there, Stryker promptly begins interrogating its people but they refuse to reveal anything, so instead, Stryker orders the team to begin killing the villagers. However, their attack is soon interrupted by Logan, claiming killing innocent people isn't what he signed up for, and he ultimately quits the team, although without his brother, as Victor chooses to stay. Following the US's withdrawal from the Vietnam War, Charles began to find his purpose once again, and ultimately decided to reopen the school with the same vision he had previously of helping young mutants. 
Also at some point over the last six years, Logan moves to the Canadian Rockies, where by 1979, he lives and is in a romantic relationship with school teacher Kayla Silverfox, who's aware but not afraid of his mutant abilities. Logan also now works as a lumberjack, although his work is suddenly interrupted one day by the arrival of Stryker and Zero, who've come to ask for his help, as recently, both Wade Wilson and Chris Bradley were reportedly killed by an unknown assailant, who they believe is looking to track down the rest of Team X as well. But Logan refuses to offer them any assistance, claiming he can take care of himself. Unfortunately, it seems Logan's next on this unknown killer's list of victims, as while at work, he begins to sense the presence of his brother, who he hasn't seen since his departure from the team. And after following the scent, he soon comes across Kayla's car abandoned in a ditch as well as her body, and it appears she's been killed by Victor. So Logan tracks his brother down at a bar, and the two promptly engage in a huge brawl, which Victor ultimately comes out on top of after launching Logan into oncoming traffic and stomping off the bone claws on his left hand before exiting. The following day, Logan's once again met by Stryker in hopes that he'd now be more willing to form an alliance, as Stryker believes he may be able to give Logan the tools to stop and defeat his brother using the meteorite he'd been searching for six years ago, and Logan, determined to kill Victor for what he's done, agrees. So Logan's later taken to an abandoned military compound in the Canadian Rockies and prepared for the Weapon X operation to bond his skeleton with adamantium, a metal compound created from the meteorite capable of withstanding virtually anything. This process, though, proves to be incredibly painful and life-threatening, with it actually causing Logan to momentarily flatline. But thanks to his healing factor, he returns to life with the adamantium bonding complete. But as he's incapacitated, Stryker makes his true motivations clear, as he and Zero discuss bringing Logan to the island before ordering to have Logan's memory erased so they could use his DNA for the Weapon 11. Fortunately, though, this conversation's overheard by Logan, who comes bursting out of his pod and fights off every guard in his path before ultimately breaking out of the building and escaping down a waterfall. But he's not able to remain out of their sights for long as he's soon tracked down and attacked by a unit of Stryker's men led by Zero, who ultimately fail in taking him down as he instead manages to take out each vehicle pursuing him along with Zero's chopper, who's killed in a huge explosion. To try and understand more of what happened with Team X over the last six years and what Stryker's true plans are, Logan heads to Las Vegas to reunite with John Rath, and he reveals that, after Logan's exit, Stryker began sending the team on missions to hunt down other mutants, claiming they'd be making a difference by protecting people from the bad ones. John doesn't know much about this island Stryker and Zero had been talking about though, but believes Fred Dukes might, so he takes Logan to see him and Fred reveals that the island is where Stryker takes and experiments on mutants after Victor's captured them, seeking to combine their powers and create the perfect soldier. Furious upon learning Stryker's been working with Victor this entire time, Logan demands to know the island's location, so Fred directs him to one of Stryker's escaped prisoners, Remy LeBeau, aka Gambit, who along with John, Logan soon finds at the casino. Although Remy initially believes he's working for Stryker and so attacks him, but Logan ultimately manages to come out on top of the battle and eventually convinces Remy to take him to the island. As they were fighting though, John was also attacked and unfortunately quickly killed by Victor who'd also killed Fred just moments after John and Logan had left the gym. Upon arriving at the island, revealed to be the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant, Logan sneaks his way into the facility and is quickly spotted by Stryker, who finally reveals the truth, explaining he's always planned on using him for his powers, but since he abandoned him and the team, he was forced to form a new strategy using Kayla, who's revealed to still be alive and to have been working with Stryker all this time as well, as she's also a mutant with the ability to influence people upon touching them. Heartbroken and shocked, Logan decides to cut his losses and exits, and with Logan seemingly dealt with, Kayla then asks that Stryker make good on his end of the deal and freeze her sister, another mutant named Emma. But he still wants to run some more tests and refuses, prompting her, now realizing she's being used, to try and make a run for it. But he's stopped in her tracks by Victor, who begins strangling her to death, until Logan suddenly returns and attacks him. Despite wanting to kill his brother though, he chooses to restrain himself for now and just knocks him out, before being met again by Kayla, who begs for his help in freeing her sister, and he agrees, freeing her along with all of Stryker's other imprisoned mutants. Their escape from the facility is immediately interrupted though by Stryker's Weapon 11, revealed to be a still alive Wade Wilson who's now been transformed into Deadpool, forcing Kayla and the mutants to look for a different way out while Logan battles against him. 
But yet again, the mutants are intercepted by a unit of Stryker's men, who, thanks to Emma's diamond heart skin and another mutant, Alex Summers' brother Scott's laser eyes, are easily thwarted, allowing them to make their way out of the building, although without Kayla, who despite having been shot in the abdomen during the attack, decides to stay back to try and help Logan. And the mutants, upon exiting the facility, are then met and transported off the island by Charles Xavier. Logan and Deadpool's battle, meanwhile, has quickly traveled all the way up one of the nuclear reactor's cooling towers, atop of which Deadpool nearly decapitates Logan, but he's fortunately thwarted by Victor, refusing to let anyone but himself kill Logan. So, the two brothers fight side by side once again, eventually allowing Logan the opportunity to decapitate Deadpool with his animantium claws. Although his eyes continue firing energy blasts out as his head falls down the tower, resulting in it crumbling to the ground, and in turn, for Logan to lose sight of his brother. Logan's then reunited with a wounded Kayla, who tells him she loves him before the two share a kiss, and he prepares to carry her off the island. Although that's then interrupted when he's suddenly shot with animantium bullets by Stryker, prompting Logan to furiously rush towards him, which inadvertently gives Stryker a clean shot directly at his head, knocking him out. After firing one shot into Logan's skull, Stryker prepares to kill Kayla as well, but she's able to grab hold of his leg and influence him into throwing the gun away and walking out of here until his feet bleed, before she finally passes away from her wound while Logan then awakens in a confused state with no memory of what just took place or who he even is, outside of his dog tag reading the names Logan and Wolverine. Shifting away from Logan now, and back to Professor X and Magneto, who at some point within the last 12 years were able to reconcile, possibly after Eric managed to prove he was in fact not behind the murder of JFK, since he's no longer imprisoned when the two are seen next in 1986, now traveling together to recruit mutants for Xavier's school, such as a young girl named Jean Grey, who also has telepathic abilities like Charles, as well as telekinetic powers. But again, within the years following this, Charles and Eric find themselves at odds with one another, and decide to go their separate ways. Ten years following this, we're introduced to yet another young mutant named Warren Worthington III, whose mutation causes him to grow large white wings, which he attempts to cut off as to avoid his father seeing them, but he's caught while doing so and his father is left horrified. A few years after this, in Meridian, Mississippi, we meet another young mutant named Marie Encantu, as she also realizes her powers for the first time, upon having her first kiss with her boyfriend David, who immediately falls unconscious and his body begins trembling, prompting Marie to let out a scream of terror that draws the attention of her parents, who rush to call an ambulance while Marie repeatedly screams for them not to touch her. Later, we learn the kiss ended up putting David in a coma for three weeks, while the traumatic experience and the manifestation of her mutant abilities, which causes her to absorb the life force of whomever she touches, leads Marie, now going by Rogue, to run away from home, eventually hitchhiking all the way to northern Alberta, Canada, and being dropped off at a bar, in which she comes across a cage wrestling match between a random bar patron and the defending champion Wolverine who spent the last 20 plus years wandering the earth in search of who and what he is. After easily winning several fights that night, Logan takes a seat at the bar to have a beer, before being confronted by one of his opponents, who claims to know Logan's a mutant, and threatens him with a knife for his money back, which in turn, prompts Logan to pull out his metal claws before ultimately exiting. His exit's then immediately followed by Rogues, hoping he'd let her hitchhike with him, and Logan, although initially refusing, ultimately lets her. Their ride is soon interrupted though, when a tree is suddenly thrown into their path, causing Logan to crash before then being attacked by Sabretooth, who we learn is actually Logan's brother Victor, now even more animalistic than before, and with seemingly no memory of their shared history, although it's unclear how he came to be this way. This version of Sabretooth proves to be quite the challenge for Logan, as the latter is eventually knocked out and nearly killed, but he and Rogue are ultimately saved by the arrival of two X-Men a now adult Scott Summers, also known as Cyclops, and another mutant named Aurora Monroe, aka Storm, who has the ability to control weather, and their combined powers force Victor to flee. Rogue and an incapacitated Logan are then transported all the way to Westchester, New York, and to Xavier's school for gifted youngsters, where Logan, after receiving medical attention from a now adult Dr. Jean Grey, who immediately becomes romantically fixated on despite her being Scott's girlfriend, is informed by Professor X of where he is and why they've brought him here, explaining that the mutant who'd attacked him was sent by another very powerful mutant named Magneto, 
who believes a war is brewing between mutants and the rest of humanity, stemming from US Senator Robert Kelly's recent attempts to pass the Mutant Registration Act, which would force mutants to publicly reveal their identities and abilities. Logan struggles to take any of this seriously, but he ultimately agrees to stay at the X Mansion after Charles promises, in exchange for 48 hours to find out what Magneto wants with him, to help Logan piece together his forgotten past. Speaking of Senator Kelly, we see now as his chopper is hijacked by a mutant named Toad, who we briefly introduced about 30 years ago, and Mystique, who since we last saw her, has now become completely corrupted by Eric, and the two then bring the Senator before Eric to be used as the first test subject for his mutant conversion machine. Powered by Magneto himself, and which emits radiation that triggers mutation in ordinary humans, as it does to Senator Kelly, giving him elastic and aquatic adaptive abilities, both of which he later uses to escape Magneto's imprisonment and eventually wash up on a beach. Meanwhile, back at the X-Mansion, Logan has difficulty sleeping his first night there due to visions of the experimentation done to him. So Rogue enters his room to wake him up, but this just startles Logan, leading him to inadvertently stab her through the chest with his claws. Seeing no other way to survive this, Rogue then grabs hold of a horrified Logan and begins absorbing his life force which also allows her to absorb his mutant abilities and use them to heal her wounds, while Logan falls unconscious, although he fortunately awakens later completely fine. Rogue, though, is made to feel terrible about what she'd done by her classmate and crush, Bobby Drake, aka Iceman, capable of freezing anything around him as well as his entire body, who berates her for using her powers against another mutant and encourages her to leave the school, which she does, before it's then revealed that Bobby was actually Mystique in disguise. Logan and the X-Men soon learn of Rogue's departure, so Charles heads down into the sub-basement and uses the X-Mansion Cerebro to locate Rogue at the train station, where Logan quickly tracks her down, apologizes for what happened, and ultimately convinces her to come back to the school. Before they can head back though, the train is suddenly torn apart by Magneto who, after using Logan's metallic skeleton against him to render him completely useless, shifts his attention onto Rogue, revealing she's the one he's really been after before abducting and exiting with her. We also see that while the X-Men are occupied with the situation, Mystique, still disguised as Bobby, manages to sneak her way down to the sub-basement and gain access to Cerebro, which she then tampers with before reuniting with Magneto and the rest of his Brotherhood of Mutants. As the X-Men attempt to figure out what Eric wants with Rogue, they're met at the school by Senator Kelly, who appears to be in very poor health, and not wanting to go to a hospital in his current state, instead came here in search of Dr. Gray. After taking a look into the Senator's mind, Charles learns of Eric's mutant conversion machine, and realizes why he's abducted Rogue, seeing that powering the machine weakens Eric, so he must be planning to transfer his power to her, so she can be sacrificed to power it instead. Shortly following this revelation though, things quickly take a turn for the worst, as Senator Kelly's body begins to completely reject the mutation, ultimately resulting in it dissolving, while Charles, when attempting to locate Rogue again using Cerebro, suddenly falls into a coma due to Mystique's tampering. But luckily, Jean's able to quickly fix it and decides to try using it herself for the first time, which thankfully doesn't cause her any harm and allows her to locate Rogue at the Statue of Liberty. So the X-Men, now joined by Wolverine, make their way over to Liberty Island, where Magneto's already begun powering his machine, and where the heroes immediately enter a battle against his Brotherhood of Mutants. With Storm eventually taking out Toad with a lightning bolt, Wolverine taking out Mystique disguised as Storm with a stab through the abdomen, and Cyclops, Jean, and Wolverine working together to take down Sabretooth. But for the team then once again, use their combined powers to guide Logan up to the machine, so that he, after Cyclops manages to incapacitate Magneto with a blast, can destroy it and free Rogue. Unfortunately though, it appears the damage has already been done, with Rogue unlikely to survive. So in an attempt to save her, Logan allows her to absorb his healing abilities, and this works in bringing her back to life, but leaves him severely injured and in a coma that he once again later wakes up from, alongside Professor X. With Eric now back in prison, Charles looks to make good on his promise from earlier, and directs Logan to an abandoned military compound at Alkali Lake in the Canadian Rockies. Although, when he eventually gets there, there's nothing left of it to be found. So Logan returns to the school, where he finds the professor in the midst of searching for a mutant who'd recently unleashed an attack against and nearly killed the president, causing him and the rest of the X-Men to worry that this may lead the president to declare a state of emergency. 
So once having discovered the mutant's location in Boston, Charles sends Storm and Jean to find out why he'd attempted the assassination. And upon meeting the mutant, Kurt Wagner, also known as Nightcrawler, who has teleportation abilities, he reveals that he didn't want to hurt anyone, but felt as if he had no control over his own mind or body, and a scar left on the back of his neck makes it seem that he may have been forced to attack the White House. Charles, meanwhile, makes his way over with Scott to Eric's plastic prison to see if maybe he had something to do with it, but he instead finds Eric in a much worse state than he'd previously left him in as it's revealed that lately he's been having frequent visits from one William Stryker, the man actually behind Kurt's attack, and who since his failed attempts to build the perfect mutant soldier years ago, had begun looking for a way to fix the world's mutant problem altogether, which he believes he may now be able to do thanks to Eric's imprisonment, as it's allowed him access to information he wouldn't have been able to uncover otherwise, such as the location of Xavier's school and Cerebro, which he's forced Eric to reveal using a serum that he'd also used on Nightcrawler, derived from his now lobotomized son Jason's brain. Immediately following this revelation, Eric and Charles are suddenly incapacitated by some sort of gas slowly being pumped into his cell, before Scott's then easily knocked out and abducted alongside the Professor by one of Stryker's mind-controlled mutants, Yuriko Oyama, aka Lady Deathstrike. Back at the school, with Jean, Storm, Scott, and Charles all gone, Logan's been left alone to watch over the kids, a job that's made even more difficult by the sudden arrival of a bunch of armed men who attempt to tranquilize and abduct multiple children. But thanks to help from one of Xavier's older students, Peter Rasputin, aka Colossus, as well as Bobby and Rogue, who are now dating, and Bobby's best friend, John Allardyce, aka Pyro, he's able to lead the kids to safety. Although, just before exiting as well, he hears the familiar voice of Stryker, leaving him almost frozen in place until he's rushed out of the building by the older kids. Logan then travels all the way to Boston to meet back up with Jean and Storm, and not too long after they're reunited, the group's flight is interrupted by Magneto, who'd managed to escape his plastic prison not too long after Xavier was abducted thanks to help from Mystique. The reason they've now tracked down the X-Men, though, is so they could form some sort of alliance. As Magneto reveals Stryker's plans of using his son's powers against Charles to manipulate him into killing every mutant on Earth with the use of his base's own Cerebro. And although reluctant to work together with their recent foes, the team ultimately agrees to become temporary allies. So, after Jean uses her abilities to uncover the location of Stryker's base, revealed to be underground at Alkali Lake, the team prepares a plan of attack. Although before beginning their journey to the base, Logan pulls Jean aside for a moment, unable to fend off his feelings for her. And despite Jean claiming she loves Scott, Logan still decides to plan a kiss on her anyway, leaving her conflicted and prompting her to storm off. Once at the base, the team quickly manages to take out every guard in their path before splitting up. With Jean, Magneto, and Mystique heading towards Cerebro, Storm and Kurt freeing the few kids Stryker had abducted, and Wolverine going off on his own in search of Stryker himself. Jean, Magneto, and Mystique are quickly intercepted, though, by a sudden attack from a mind-controlled Cyclops, who Jean stays back to fight off while they continue forward. And eventually, she's able to free him from Stryker's control by reversing one of his blasts back onto him, which inadvertently ends up damaging the dam, as noticed by Stryker, who decides it's time to cut and run. And so, he informs his son that it's time to find and kill all the mutants. As he then begins making his way out of the base, he comes across Logan, stood within the same room where the Weapon X procedure had taken place, which causes his memories of that day to finally return to the surface, before Stryker then six Lady Deathstrike onto him, who's revealed to have also gone through a similar procedure with animantium claws of her own. But ultimately, after a violent and mostly balanced fight, Logan's able to just narrowly come out on top by injecting her with some of Stryker's raw adamantium, presumably killing her. Magneto, meanwhile, arrives at and promptly tears open the door to Cerebro, halting Jason's attempts at killing all the world's mutants, and soon joining them is Mystique disguised as William Stryker, who gives Jason a new mission to instead find and kill every human on Earth, before the two then exit and fly off the base, although just before leaving, Eric also finds and chains up Stryker, leaving him for dead. Eric's plan is soon discovered and also thwarted though by the X-Men, with Storm being teleported into Cerebro by Nightcrawler, so she can then use her powers to freeze Jason until he gives up control over Charles, preventing him from killing anyone, before the heroes promptly rush out of the base as the dam's begun to collapse. However, it doesn't appear they'll be able to escape the impending flood as their jet refuses to start, but their lives are ultimately saved by Jean, 
who slips out of the ship amid the chaos and locks it behind her, before using her powers to lift it up into the sky while simultaneously holding off the flood until they're high enough to take off. And once they are, she allows herself to be engulfed by the flood, leaving both Scott and Logan heartbroken. A few years pass before we get to see any of the X-Men again, but even still, Jean's death continues to weigh on them greatly, as is specifically the case for Scott, who struggled to do much of anything since her passing, leaving Logan and Storm having to fill in for him on numerous occasions, and it appears he may now be getting worse than ever, as he's begun hearing Jean's voice calling out for him, which prompts him to make the trip back to Alkali Lake. There, the sound of her voice grows even louder, but he just believes it's his mind playing tricks on him. That is until, shockingly, Jean suddenly emerges from the ocean, somehow still alive, allowing the two to share a long-awaited embrace and a kiss, although as they're kissing, something strange begins happening to Scott, drawing Professor X's attention from all the way at the X-Mansion. So Charles orders Logan and Storm to head over to Alkali Lake and find him, but the only person they end up finding is an unconscious Jean. While examining her, Charles reveals some previously hidden information about her to Logan that he now must know, explaining that Jean is the only Class 5 mutant he's ever encountered, meaning her potential is practically limitless. But her mutation happens to be seated in the unconscious part of her mind, making her potential incredibly dangerous. So Charles, when she was just a young girl, created a series of psychic barriers to isolate her powers from her conscious mind, allowing them to remain under control. Although this also resulted in her developing a dual personality that in their sessions came to call itself the Phoenix, which he worries may come to the surface if he doesn't restore the psychic blocks he'd previously set. And Charles is soon proven justified for trying to keep the Phoenix under control, as after Jean eventually awakens, she suddenly attacks Logan as she makes her way out of the school. Coinciding with all of this going on with Jean is the recent development of what's been dubbed the Mutant Cure created by major pharmaceutical company, Worthington Labs, owned by Warren Worthington II, who'd begun searching for this cure after discovering his own son was a mutant 10 years ago. Although his son isn't in support of this mutant gene suppressor, it turns out, as he actually refuses to receive a dose of it, before flying off to Xavier's school to be surrounded by others like him. The cure, though, has left other mutants somewhat divided, with quite a few considering receiving a dose, such as Rogue, having grown frustrated with not being able to be intimate with Bobby, while others like Magneto are enraged by what they consider to be an attempt at exterminating them all. So Magneto's begun rapidly recruiting other mutants to his brotherhood in preparation for his much anticipated war against humans, including the likes of Pyro, who'd actually decided to join his brotherhood shortly after the events at Alkali Lake. Having grown tired of keeping his true self hidden from the world, Kalisto, Quill, Arclight, James Madrox, aka Multiple Man, and the Juggernaut, Kane Marco. And upon learning of Jean's re-emergence, with even greater power than before, Magneto hopes to recruit her for his cause as well. Despite the various new members of his brotherhood though, he also ends up losing an important one, as recently, Mystique had been apprehended. Although she wasn't in custody for long, as Magneto soon managed to intercept her transport convoy and aid her in escaping. But shortly after being freed from her cell, a still alive guard fires a tranquilizer dart at her, revealed to be filled with the mutant cure, which transforms her into an ordinary human and in turn, causes Magneto to leave her behind, claiming she's no longer one of them. The government's use of the mutant cure as a weapon against Mystique has left one person in particular greatly disturbed and disappointed, with that person being the current Secretary of Mutant Affairs, Hank McCoy who hasn't been seen at the X-Mansion for quite some time due to him getting more and more involved with the government in hopes of bettering the lives of mutants. But following what's transpired, he's led to resign from his position so that he can be where he belongs as Magneto's war approaches. The X-Men, though, are still wrapped up in whatever's going on with Jean, who Charles is eventually able to pinpoint the location of, tracking her down at her old family home just as Eric manages to do the same. So the two enter the house together, with Eric urging her to accept her newfound power, while Charles tries his best to bring the real Jean back. And unfortunately, she ultimately chooses the former, although not in the way Eric had expected or hoped for, as she shockingly uses her immense power to seemingly kill Charles, before exiting the house with a shooken up Magneto. As the X-Men and their students mourn the loss of their beloved professor, Magneto continues pushing forward with his mission, having Pyro attack Worthington Lab's new facility and broadcasting a public address, warning them that, so long as the cure exists, their war will rage, before preparing his army for their next mission, 
to abduct the source of the mutant cure. A young mutant boy named Jimmy, also called Leech, who has the ability to nullify the powers of other mutants when they come near him. The X-Men, now again joined by Beast, soon become aware of these plans though, and so, despite being significantly outnumbered, prepare to intercept Magneto and hopefully prevent this war from going any further. With them eventually arriving in the midst of a battle between his brotherhood and US soldiers armed with cure weapons. These weapons are quickly rendered useless though by one of Arclight's shockwaves, which destroys seemingly all of them and puts the humans at an even greater disadvantage as Magneto sends the Juggernaut to fetch Leech, while the rest of his brotherhood now battles the X-Men. Juggernaut's attempted abduction ultimately ends up being foiled though by a young mutant and close friend of Bobby named Kitty Pride, aka Shadowcat, who has the ability to phase through matter, which she uses to outrun the Juggernaut and free Jimmy before he can catch up to them. Unfortunately, the X-Men's battle doesn't appear to be going quite as well, as the combined powers of Magneto and Pyro begin to overwhelm them. But soon, they're able to devise a plan upon finding a few cure darts scattered on the battlefield. Which, after Iceman takes his former best friend out of the picture, Beast's able to drive into Magneto's chest thanks to a distraction from Wolverine, ridding him of his mutant abilities. With Eric finally defeated, Logan approaches Jean, hoping he may still be able to get her back on their side of the fight but she instead unleashes another telekinetic storm that continues growing and growing, forcing everyone on both sides to make a run for it, as well as turning many of them into dust. Logan though manages to fight through the storm and make it face to face with Jean, who furiously questions why he'd risk dying for these people. No, not for them, for you. These few words prove to be enough to finally bring Jean's true self back to the surface for a brief moment, with her begging Logan to save her. And so, after telling her he loves her, he pulls out his claws and fatally stabs her through the abdomen, bringing an end to the phoenix's destruction. In the seven years after being forced to kill the woman he loved, Logan's begun living as a hermit in the Canadian wilderness. That is until the one day he's met by a woman named Yukio, revealed to also be a mutant with a haunting ability, as she's able to foresee the deaths of others. The reason she's tracked him down though isn't because of his own death, but the death of a man he'd saved the life of years ago, Ichiro Yoshida, now one of the most powerful business leaders in Japan. As with Yoshida's health rapidly deteriorating as he's grown older, he's asked that Logan meet with him in person so he could say goodbye. Upon reuniting with Logan for the first time in almost 70 years though, Yoshida reveals that he hadn't actually sent for him just to say goodbye, but also to repay him, claiming that his technology company, the Yoshida Corporation, could possibly rid him of the curse he's been forced to carry for over a century and a half, the inability to die, and pass it on to himself. But Logan, although yearning to escape this life and the haunting memories of his past, refuses Yoshida's offer, believing he's better off without the burden. In that night, as Logan sleeps, he's met by Yukio, who informs him that Yoshida has died, much to her own confusion, as she hadn't foreseen it. And things become even more strange during Yoshida's subsequent funeral, when it's suddenly attacked by disguised members of the Yakuza. Still, Logan's able to take out nearly all of the ceremony's attackers, with help from an unknown man firing arrows from above. Before they can reach their primary target, Yoshida's granddaughter Mariko, who Logan eventually escapes with to her home in Nagasaki. There, Logan gets a better understanding of why she may have been targeted, as she explains that, despite her not wanting it, her grandfather had decided to leave her control of his company in his will, much to the surprise and frustration of her father Shingen, who's seeking to kill her so he can take control of Yoshida's company. As the two remain hidden for the next couple days, they quickly begin lusting over one another, eventually leading to them having sex. Although the next morning, the Yakuza finally manage to track them down and abduct Mariko for Shingen. We then see as he now has Mariko brought before him so he can follow through with that objective himself. But before he can harm her, his home is quietly attacked by a group of ninjas known as the Black Clan, led by a childhood friend of Mariko's, Kanuchio Harada, who escorts Mariko out of the home while Shingen is met by Yoshida's oncologist, Dr. Green, revealed to also be a mutant known as Viper, with the ability to spit poisonous substances that she now uses to incapacitate Shingen before leaving a note behind reading Come Get Her beside an image of one of Yoshida's facilities in the north, to be found shortly thereafter by Logan. Before making the journey there with Yukio though, Shingen re-emerges and blaming Logan for all that's happened, he attempts to kill him, 
but his attack ultimately fails as he's instead the one who's killed. Upon arriving at Yoshida's lab, Logan's unfortunately soon incapacitated by a poisoned arrow from Harada, and eventually awakens trapped in an animantium device, locking his arms and claws in place, before Viper then introduces him to the Silver Samurai, an incredibly powerful suit of armor made completely with animantium, in which suddenly rises to its feet and prepares to slice off Logan's claws with a heated sword. But its attack is thwarted by Mariko, who manages to escape Harada's custody and take the Silver Samurai down, in turn freeing Logan, who then enters into a battle against the giant, while Yukio finally arrives to battle and ultimately kill Viper. Logan doesn't fare quite as well in his fight though, despite gaining help from Harada after he'd realized the error of his ways, as the Silver Samurai manages to stab and kill Harada while also slicing off each of Logan's claws and drilling itself into the wounds so that it can begin transferring his life force and ability to heal to Ichiro Yoshida, revealed to still be alive thanks to the Silver Samurai suit's life-prolonging capabilities. But Yoshida's plan ultimately fails after Mariko, refusing to let her grandfather kill Logan for his own gain, launches a knife at the back of his head, allowing Logan a moment to regain his strength and pull out his bone claws to bring Yoshida's life to an definitive end. With this all finally over, and now with a greater appreciation for the life he has, Logan's able to finally move on from Jean's death. And so after giving Mariko a kiss goodbye, he hops on a plane with Yukio, ready to once again begin using his powers for good. We're then taken forward two years as Logan enters an airport and is shockingly met by none other than Magneto, whose powers since receiving the mutant cure have returned, likely meaning that the cure was actually only temporary. Eric's not here looking for a fight as Logan had expected, however, as he's actually seeking his help, revealing that there are human forces building a weapon that could bring the end of their kind, which Logan struggles to believe having no reason to trust Eric. That is until the two are joined by a somehow still alive Charles. It turns out that despite both Bolivar Trask and William Stryker having passed, research for the Sentinel program had still continued on for all these years at Trask Industries, and is now complete, creating giant, highly advanced robots capable of not only targeting and killing mutants, but also with the ability to adapt to any mutant power, thanks to the experiments that done on Mystique over 40 years ago. Over time though, the Sentinels AI began to evolve, as they stopped only targeting mutants and began targeting humans with potential to have mutant children as well, resulting in Earth by 2023 becoming a war-torn wasteland, with both mutants and humans on the brink of extinction. There are still quite a few mutants who've managed to survive all this time, including some we haven't yet met, like James Proudstar aka Warpath, Claris Ferguson aka Blink, Roberto da Costa aka Sunspot, and Lucas Bishop as well as multiple X-Men, including Shadowcat and Iceman, who are now dating, Colossus, Storm, Magneto, Professor X, and Wolverine. Also, at some point during the last few years, Kitty, as she grew older, developed another mutant ability, the ability to project one's consciousness into the body of their past self, which her and the rest of Bishop's group, the Free Mutants, have been using in order to alter the past to avoid sentinel attacks but the X-Men believe it could potentially allow one of them to jump even further into the past and prevent this war from ever beginning, which Charles traces all the way back to Bolivar Trask's assassination at the hands of Mystique in 1973. Kitty, though, claims going that far back would tear the person's mind apart, so Logan offers himself up for the mission, since his healing factor would likely prevent that, and the group ultimately agrees. For this mission, Charles and Eric inform Logan that, in order to change Mystique's path, he must find both of their younger selves and convince them of all that's happened, which may be difficult due to the state they were each in mentally at the time, but Charles is still optimistic that this plan will work. Upon awakening in his 1973 self, Logan makes his way to the X-Mansion, where he's met by a younger Hank McCoy, who tries and fails to stop him from entering, prompting Hank to transform into the beast and attack him, until Charles eventually enters the room to see what's up, and although initially laughing at Logan's claims, he's quickly convinced he's telling the truth after Logan retells the story of Charles's powers first manifesting when he was a young boy. A story Charles hadn't told anyone yet up to this point. So they hear him out and Charles again laughs in his face after he suggests a reunion with Magneto. But ultimately, his love for both him and Raven convinced him to at least try. As mentioned before though, Eric is currently imprisoned beneath the Pentagon. So to break him out, Logan tracks down a future friend of his, who he hadn't yet had the chance to meet, named Peter Maximoff, aka Quicksilver, a mutant capable of moving at superhuman speeds, 
who is easily convinced to help, intrigued by the prospect of breaking into the Pentagon. And thanks to Peter's incredible speed, they are able to quickly free Eric without leaving behind any casualties. Peter then returns home, while Eric, Charles, Logan, and Hank journey on a flight to Paris, during which Charles verbally attacks Eric for taking Raven and abandoning him, which in turn prompts Eric to berate Charles for going into hiding, while others like Banshee, Angel, Azazel, and Emma were all killed. But eventually, the two are able to cool down and finally make amends, with Eric even apologizing for his actions that led to Charles' paralysis. By the time the four arrive in Paris, it's mere moments before Mystique would fatally shoot Trask, which they managed to prevent for the time being. But while the original plan was for Charles to talk her down, Eric decides to take matters into his own hands, grabbing hold of a gun and firing it at Mystique in order to secure their future. Although fortunately for her, the bullet only manages to pierce her leg as she jumps out the window and makes her escape while Beast attacks Eric to prevent him from harming her any further. This public display of mutant violence leaves humans even more afraid of mutants than they already were, allowing Trask to easily convince the president to give his Sentinel program the green light, with the president even requesting that multiple prototypes of the machines be present during his upcoming announcement outside the White House to prove to the American people that they're capable of protecting them. Following what took place in Paris, Eric decides to once again go off on his own, while Charles, Hank, and Logan return to the X-Mansion, upon which Charles begins losing the use of his legs and regaining his telepathic ability, due to Hank's serum slowly wearing off. So Hank rushes to fetch him another dose as Charles becomes overwhelmed by the pain and suffering of others. Although Logan believes that if they're gonna find Mystique, Charles will have to retain his powers and use Cerebro. So despite greatly wanting these voices to just go away, he ultimately agrees to do it. He unfortunately fails in his first attempt though, so Logan, unable to offer him the help he needs himself, asks Charles to take a look into his mind in search of not just Logan's future, but his own. And once he does, it allows Charles' 2023 self to communicate with him, who urges Charles not to give up hope, even whilst knowing all that humanity will do to hurt them in the future. Just because someone stumbles, loses their way, it doesn't mean they're lost forever. And his words ultimately succeed in convincing Charles to embrace his power once again, enabling him to locate Mystique, who's seen on her way to Washington, D.C., so the trio quickly make their way there as well. However, it ends up not just being Mystique they have to worry about, but also Eric, who suddenly arrives carrying an entire stadium along with him, and much to the shock of Trask, takes control of his Sentinels, which Trask had specifically built without the use of metal. But Eric was still able to infuse steel into each of the machines ahead of the event. He then drops the stadium around the White House to trap the President Trask and other powerful US officials inside, who quickly rush into the President's underground bunker, not realizing that one of the Secret Servicemen is actually Mystique in disguise. Although she's once again prevented from killing Trask by Magneto, who after sicking a sentinel onto Beast and engaging in a short battle with Wolverine, that ends with him brutally piercing Logan's skin with several pieces of rebar before launching him over the stadium and into the ocean, tears the entire bunker out from under the White House and prepares to kill everyone inside for the entire world to see. Although that's then halted by the president stepping out from the bunker and offering his life in exchange for everyone else's, which distracts Magneto for a moment, allowing the president, soon revealed to actually be Mystique in disguise, to fire a gunshot straight through the side of his neck and knock him out, which causes the Sentinels to power down as well. She then looks to finally kill Trask once and for all, before suddenly everyone around her is frozen in place by Charles, who, with her now positioned to be perceived as the hero, telepathically pleads with her one last time not to do it. But despite being able to, he refuses to use his power against and make that decision for her, instead leaving it in her hands. And luckily, she makes the right decision in the end, sparing Trask, who's subsequently imprisoned and has his Sentinel program shut down to successfully prevent their grim fates in the future, as seen when Logan's consciousness finally returns to his 2023 body and he awakens in the X-Mansion, where he's greeted by many of the friends he'd lost over the years, such as Rogue, Hank, Scott, and Jean, before meeting with the Professor so he can help him catch up on all that's happened in the last 50 years. Just five years after preventing the extinction of mutant kind though, their race is faced with yet another tragedy, as suddenly one day, Charles, now suffering from Alzheimer's disease, slips into a seizure that causes him to lose control of his telepathic abilities and inflict an immense amount of psychic pain onto those within range, paralyzing their minds and bodies and leaving them unable to breathe. And ultimately, this seizure causes injuries to around 600 people, in addition to the deaths of several X-Men. 
In response to what would later be dubbed the Westchester Incident, Charles Xavier's mind is declared a weapon of mass destruction by the US government. So, to avoid the government imprisoning Charles or even sentencing him to death, Logan, whose healing factor had helped him survive the seizure, has himself and the professor declared dead as they go into hiding, with the two seen a year later living in an abandoned smelting plant in northern Mexico, along with another mutant named Caliban, capable of locating and tracking mutants with his superhuman sense of smell. Also over the course of the last year, it's become apparent that for some unidentified reason, mutants have just been dying off, leaving the race on the brink of extinction once again, since there haven't been any new mutants born in the last 25 years either. So Logan, with the X-Men all presumably gone outside of himself and Charles, has been left without a purpose in life, now spending his days working as a chauffeur under his birth name James Howlett to try and remain hidden in order to pay for Charles' medication and keep him alive, despite him no longer wanting to live himself. As after 50 years of living with an animantium skeleton, the metal has begun poisoning him, weakening his healing factor and in turn, causing him to begin aging rapidly. All of which has made him consider just ending it all with the same adamantium bullet Stryker had shot him in the head with that he's held onto through all these years. Somehow though, Logan's life is soon made even more complicated when he's approached by a woman named Gabriela Lopez, who's aware of who he is and desperately needs his help in escaping the men coming to kill her and the young girl she's with named Laura. So in exchange for $20,000, she asks that he drive them across the border to Canada, and Logan, although reluctant, agrees to take them the following morning. When he arrives the next day though, he finds she's already been killed, with the young girl nowhere to be found. So he returns home, only to discover that Laura had actually hitched a ride in his trunk, leading to the subsequent arrival of a group of cybernetically enhanced humans called the Reavers, led by Donald Pierce, head of security for scientific corporation Alkali Transigen and they promptly attack Logan and abduct Caliban as they make their way towards Laura. But she proves to be much stronger than she appears, shockingly pulling out adamantium claws similar to Logan's, and viciously killing many of them en route to escaping with Charles and Logan. Through a video made by Gabriella in the event of her death, the two learn that Laura, also labeled X-23, and many other children, were birthed in Transigen's research facility in Mexico City, using DNA samples stolen from older mutants with the source of Laura's DNA in particular being Logan, making her his biological daughter. The reason Transigen has begun breeding mutants was so that they could turn them into mutant soldiers, but after failing to control the children in the way they'd hoped, they decided to shut the program down in favor of a new one, and so began euthanizing the kids, leading Gabriella, who worked there as a nurse, to try and free as many of them as she could, and lead them to what's believed to be a sanctuary for mutants called Eden. But on the way, she and Laura had got separated from the others, so she now needs Logan to take her there, and Charles urges him to do it, believing it could allow a future for mutants after all. During the trip though, they're annoyingly driven off the road by an automated freight truck, also called an auto truck, one of which also causes trouble for a family of three, Will, Catherine, and Nate Munson, along with their horses, causing them to wander out into the road. So Charles uses his telepathic abilities to send the horses back where they belong, while Logan helps push their car back onto the street, for which, as a thank you, Catherine invites the three over for dinner that night, and Charles graciously accepts. The dinner proves to actually be a much needed break for the two former X-Men, after such a long time spent without family. But sadly, things take a sudden turn for the worse that night, as Transigen have managed to uncover their location thanks to a tortured Caliban, and now unleash their newest mutant weapon onto the home, the X-24 revealed to be an exact clone of Wolverine, which shockingly kills the entire Munson family, as well as Professor X, before attempting to exit the home with Laura. Although that's quickly interrupted by the real Logan, who engages in a brutal battle against the clone that he struggles to gain the upper hand in, even nearly being killed. But luckily, he's narrowly saved by a barely still alive Will, driving his car straight into the clone and sending him flying into lawn equipment before he ultimately succumbs to his wounds. While Logan and Laura escape after Caliban, grabs hold of two grenades and creates a huge explosion to take out the rest of Transigen's men, sacrificing himself in the process. After burying the one friend he had left in this world, a furious and heartbroken Logan attempts to continue the journey to Eden, but the wounds he'd sustained during the previous battle make it difficult, eventually forcing Laura to take over the wheel and drive them there herself, which she actually manages to do, allowing her to finally reunite with her friends safe and sound. To help with Logan's injuries, the kids, led by a young boy named Richter, 
give him a dose of a serum containing the mutant growth hormone, which they'd collected from Transigen prior to their escape. And after resting for two days, Logan's able to get back on his feet, just as the kids are preparing for a journey across the border that'll not be joining them on, much to Laura's dismay. He's ultimately forced to help the kids though, upon noticing Transigen, vehicle and aircrafts following after them. So he rushes into the woods and injects himself with all the serum they had left, which grants him the strength to unleash a vicious attack and kill several weavers alongside Laura, before coming face to face with the man behind Transigen, Dr. Xander Rice, who it turns out was also the man who'd wiped out the mutant race, using genetically modified food to spread a virus that prevented natural mutant births and killed any mutant that consumed it. This revelation also immediately prompts Logan to suddenly shoot Dr. Rice through the neck, resulting in Pierce unleashing X-24 onto him once again. Although, as the two Logans battle, Pierce also finds himself completely surrounded by the kids, who use their combined powers to brutally kill him. Meanwhile, after a violent battle, X-24 eventually manages to fatally wound Logan as he shouts for Laura and the kids to run, stabbing him through and dragging him by his shoulder onto a wooden spike. But his attack is then suddenly stopped by Logan's adamantium bullet shot straight through his head by Laura. Still though, the clone's attack is just too much for Logan to come back from at this point. So with his dying breath, he urges Laura not to be the weapon they made her to be, and he appears to feel a sense of relief as he finally passes away. And that was our full timeline recap of the X-Men Universe's original timeline. If you enjoyed the video or found it helpful in any way, then make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. And if you feel like anything about the timeline should have been changed, then make sure to let us know in the comments below. But once again, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll talk to you again soon.